Hey, Britt, how are you? I am fine. I'm excited to talk to you today about my experiences and just have this really great and super important conversation. So thank you for having me. No problem. So glad that you were able to join and made time for me today. So to start off, I would like for you to tell us who is Brittany Threat and some of your academic journey. Okay. Um, and redirect me if I get too far off, but I am um, Brittany Three. I go by Brit up here because people are constantly misspelling my name. So I just give them less to mess up. Um, so I am a fifth year doctoral candidate in Africana Studies at Brown University. And my research focuses on slave legacies and Black women's science fiction and fantasy, really thinking about, of course, we thought we Black feminist thought does talk about like, how are Black women going to be in the future? Are Black women going to be in the future? I'm interested in, in this. It's not recent. I thought it was recent when I started my work, but seeing this like continuum of Black women thinking about the future vis-a-vis -vis the past. And so I really started thinking about like, how do we enfold this slave legacy thing as something that is important to like black feminist thought and not just black people writ large. And so that's what my dissertation is taking up. And that's, those are some of the questions that I'm asking. I see. So I'm really interested in the topic of slave legacy and science fiction and fantasy, but I wanna take a step back and get a little bit more of your academic journey, like where you went to undergrad and what okay. you study and what the experience was like. Yeah, I went to undergrad at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee, um, not far from Mississippi. <laughs> so I, I double majored in English literature and theater with a minor in Africana studies. Mm -hmm. And I Africana studies was a program. It wasn't even a department. And so one of the reasons that I wanted to get my PhD in Africana studies was because I was tired of having to work so hard to get to the black stuff. And I wanted a department where that was centered. Um, and so I had, I did a lot of work at Rhodes with talking to professors, emailing professors, challenging professors to put more um, black thinkers on the syllabus but I didn't know anything. I was like, I just want them, but I don't know where you should go to find them. Like, which one of us has the degree here? I'm just telling you what I want to learn mm -hmm. and what would make this syllabus fuller instead of all of these white men and white women. Like, that's it. And so a lot of my time at I have a love-hate relationship with, with, with my alma mater. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because in some ways I'm like, wow, you made everything so incredibly difficult. And on the other hand, I'm like, wow, I would not be here today had I not gone to Rhodes College mm -hmm. because I now my extended family, which is in Georgia, I'm from Arkansas, my extended family is in Georgia and Ohio, but I don't really have a relationship with the Ohio side, which is my dad's side, more of the ones um, or my my dad's like immediate family, like uncles and cousins and whatever. So most of the family that I have a relationship with on my mom and dad's side are in Georgia. And they would tell you that they already knew that I had like a big mouth, but I didn't see it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I was coming into college, it's not that I did not have a voice or own my voice, but you know, people talk a lot when it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And it does take a certain curating of your voice to know when and how to speak um, and on those stages where it is of extreme consequence. Yeah. So to, to learn not just like how to talk that talk when you're with your friends, but to be able to go to a professor and say, I really don't think this syllabus is serving anybody, not just me as a Black student, but I am very cognizant that as a Black student, none of the thinkers who you're calling worthy to be on this syllabus look anything like me or share my experience. Um, and that is a hole in the syllabus, not a me problem, right? And so I just, I had to learn how to say that, right? How to feel entitled to talk to a professor that way, how to send an email that says, I'm signed up for your class, I'm looking at the syllabus, here's what I don't see. And then when you walk in there and it's still not fixed, so I sent you an email that you said that you received and the syllabus hasn't changed. 
can we talk about that? Right. So mm-hmm. I did a lot of, I had a lot of those like difficult conversations with professors um, in my English department, in my theater department. Hey, I don't want to try out for any more roles where the character was not written to be black. Like, fine, if we're, re- if we're doing a Greek play, I can be Athena, right? And that's fine. But there, I don't find anything radical about you just casting a black student as Athena because you need another body on the stage as opposed to getting a play where Athena is reimagined as a black woman, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so, and I, I came to that in stages, sure. But if I had to pinpoint a year when it was like, and after that, it was set off. Yeah, it would yeah. probably be junior year. Um, at my freshman year was really peaceful at Rose. It really was. And then every one semester of the year after that, like every semester, there would be some viciously racist thing that happened on campus. So the first thing was Yik Yak, which was like an anonymous Twitter for like, that was like location specific. So like each campus would have its own Yik Yak. Yik Yak. Okay. Yeah. I'll technology. Yeah. Yik Yak. I was not on it. I was like, what? Okay, but I knew that it was a thing. So apparently one night, and the way Yik Yak worked was like it disappeared after 24 hours. And so, and if mm-hmm. it, and it, if a comment got it, if a comment got downvoted enough times, it would disappear before that. And so one night, someone anonymously went on Yik Yak and posted all this really racist stuff like, if I ever see a black person in a dark alley, et cetera, et cetera. If you turned a black person inside out, I would still hate them. Like just really just like anti-black, right? Like wh- how do you have time to even do this? And so obviously it got downloaded and deleted, but you know us, receipts. So people yeah. screenshotted it as soon as they saw it and they were like, yo, we're not gonna have it, this didn't happen. And so administration was like, we would like to make a statement about discussing this, is that, but like they didn't do anything. They did not contact Yik Yak to find out who, which they could have done. Because if it had been like a bomb threat against everybody, mm-hmm. you would have had that person in handcuffs the next day, next year. A student, like I think he was a freshman or a sophomore, this white boy hangs a red tipped monkey from a noose outside of his dorm window. And he was like, well, I didn't know what it meant. It's a game that we play. Me and my roommate were always seeing each other stuffed animals, which I'm like, how many stuffed animals do y'all have? But <laughs> yes, yeah, you're adult male college student. <laughs> okay. What? How many do you have? What do you mean you're always seeing each other stuffed animals? Like what? Yeah. So lies abound. But he said that he didn't know what it meant. Now, I don't, I don't, who li- who is going to a Tennessee college and doesn't know what that means? to mm-hmm. hang a monkey from a noose at high noon on a Friday. And how do you even know how to tie a noose? Like, where did you just get Where'd you college? get that from, Boy Scouts? In like, Bo- exactly. Okay. All, all, all of I mean, it's, a, it's a lot of holes in his, in his story. <laughs> and I, don't, exactly. I, don't even, I wasn't even there, so go ahead. Exactly. It's like, this, you're not making sense. So there's no way that you didn't know what that meant. And so it, it was just very crazy. The student, there was a town hall meeting where the boy was standing up there and like, we could come up and say whatever we wanted to. And there was a student who was like, I don't want an apology from you. I want you to no longer be here. You mm-hmm. should not be able to be here after that. And he wasn't, I don't even know that he was suspended for a semester. And he, all these tears, I'm so sorry, like that kind of stuff. And so after mm-hmm. I saw that, and after I saw the administration not really do anything, I got angry. I think if I had to like think about like the first time that I experienced like a very political black rage, it was around then, because that's when it was like it. And it cut for me. It came from a feeling of not apathy, but like impotency. All of these students are telling you how hurt they are, and you truly don't care, and you're not going to do anything. And we're all sitting here showing up today, knowing that. And so for me, it was like, all right. So then, what are we going to do? And so. I'm a poet. Um, I write. I, I was really into spoken word when I was in college. I still write now. Um, yes. and- I, I mean, I know you write beautiful poems because I remember one time we were just kind of like chilling at my place and you uh-huh. read some poems like a couple of years ago. I don't know if you remember it when I stayed on Wesley Ann 
Okay. A poem, and I was just like, wow, Brent, that's so beautiful. So I know that you write beautiful poetry, sis, but go ahead. Okay. I, um, so I, I got into it. I, I've been writing since high school, but like college is when I got into performance poetry. And there's just something really powerful about embodying poetry because poetry already is just such a beautiful and powerful mode of expression that allows you to emote without rules, right? Like you don't have to follow a certain structure. You can, right? There are sonnets and there are haikus, like there are ways, but you don't have to. And performance poetry allows you to do a sonnet in a way that seems unruly or to do just prose, right? Just go without any rules. And so I just love the flexibility of poetry. And so and it also seems like the only thing at the time that could really hold my rage. I did not have the patience to write a novel at that time about how I was feeling. I just wanted to spit. And so, and, po and performance poetry allows you to just go. And so I, I did, I wrote um, this spoken war on ignorance. And so it was like, a, it was, like an hour or so, and it was a series of spoken word poetry that was talking about the event, that was talking about how Rhodes College was, in, was complicit in teaching students how to perform race, ethnicity, specifically racism, right? And so, but it, before I even got into like, I'm gonna do this, I was just pissed. And so I wrote an email to all my professors that whose class I was in at the time, it was like three or four of them, but one of them is black. So obviously I was like, you're fine. But <laughs> I was in a, um, an English class and uh, two theater classes, one that was um, acting one or two and one that was dramatic theory. And then I was in like some English class, maybe it was um, not post-colonial theory, post-modern, like post-modern, literature yeah both my own literature um and that was the professor who I emailed him and was like we need to get some black people on this syllabus and his response was oh I'm teaching three beloved three and Toni Morrison novels throughout the class that I'm teaching and one of them is beloved to which my thought was I don't even want you teaching beloved because I'm not even sure you can handle that novel but we press on um yeah. and so I, I sent it to those three people it was a three paragraph email the first and the third emails were the same and they were essentially saying with the things that are ha that have been happening on this campus i am not okay so just know that when i'm in your class that these things that are happening outside your class are affecting me in your class um and the, and i we need to be honest about the role of the classroom and teaching students to act this way. And that second email, which was different, but depending on the professor, went into how that classroom was complicit in teaching students to behave in this way. What mm -hmm. is or is not on your syllabus, how we've talked about it before and there has been no change, how you allow us to talk about black things or non-white things or skirt them like those sorts of things. And then the third one, I don't even remember, but like, the the response of their professors was typical mm -hmm. of like I won't even call it white liberal guilt I would just call it white guilt um of just like not even consolatory just like I take responsibility I'm sorry d -d 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 can we meet blah 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 so was it follow with action is the question exactly so no so we met two of them we met and both of them were crying no no three of them we met one of them we met and it was my advisor I didn't even have a class with him and I didn't nor did I email him I don't even remember why we were having a meeting but like by the end of it he was crying by that point I no longer cared about white tears I don't care if you are a 17 year old girl or a middle-aged white professor I do not care so to make a long story short because it's not the point of this conversation um nothing happened at the end of that um, spoken word on ignorance, got a standing ovation. People sent it, the recorded performance to their family. The theater department started to see that people want to be here for these conversations. But then, you know, six, seven months later for Colored Girls is in the main stage. A lot of stuff happened where like different professors in the department were literally 
acting crazy around that show. And I'm glad that they did because it allowed Mason to see you have professors here who are literally trying, like getting in the way and checking up on this show that is literally called Four Colored Girls. Mm -hmm. And they're doing all of this to frustrate the production of this show. Do you not see what I'm talking about? And before he didn't, he didn't see that it was a problem with staff. He didn't see that it was a pro or faculty that he, he didn't see that we could actually get people in there to watch, not just like a cool spoken word performance, but like a show. Yeah. That show was packed for the three-day run that it had. And he said during the last run, well, I can't say anymore that people won't come to see things like this. And the next year they did as part of the season, um, Fabulation by Lynn Nottage. And they hadn't done a black play as part of the season for years, like decades even. And so like that sort of, those experiences, even just like the Cliff Notes version, um, allowed me to see how writing, um, creative writing, how continuous conversation, how ties with the community, because in addition to Miss Sticky being the director, three of the, of, of the seven women who are, you know, like in for colored girls within the community. And I did that specifically because I wanted the student actors to see if they wanted to, that you can have con connections with people outside of the city. Do you want to act at Hattie Lou? talk to Miss Sticky about it, like talk to Alyssa, like all these different women who were there. Yeah. And two of the people who were in the show ended up declaring either a major or a minor in theater. And so, cause I was the only black theater major there at the time. And so that's what I mean when I say, it. when we look at history, things change and things don't change. Did things change? Yeah. And there was even a little bit of a, a legacy after I left, but did it change something fundamental? I don't know that it did, but I'm still glad for the work that was done and for the, for the students who saw that you can make space for yourself, even if you have to elbow people aside and it's okay to elbow people and make them uncomfortable. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, while you were speaking, I heard this theme of you kind of finding your voice and learning to advocate for yourself pretty early on in my opinion because a lot of people <laughs> yeah a lot of people don't you know find the power in their voice in expressing like what they wish they had and what they want but it seemed like you did it uh you did it with a lot of rigor and force behind it and you produced action and I'm just curious about like where did Brit young Brit college Brit find her voice like what do you think what, what would you attribute or contribute or yeah like attribute those your voice to I, I really think it was writing like when you write how long had you been writing so where did writing start for you like my dad's an English teacher <laughs> so <laughs> yeah so I and writing was like English classes were always the easier, right? Because I, I have an affinity for English. My dad was always there to ask questions. So that just came easily. And when I was, um, I've always been a reader. And so reading, I loved Harry Potter. I loved The Hunger Games. I loved Lemony Snicket. Oh my gosh, Justice for Lemony. The way they did him on that Netflix, ridiculous. But anyway, um, seeing those books, I loved them. And I was like, in my head, Hermione is black, right? But she's not, she's a Mawasa. And I, I got to a point when I was like 16 where I was like, I wanna write a book where people look like me. And so when I was 16 years old, I wrote this book called, what was it? Like magic can be quite confounding or something like that. And I like, I, I was like, wow, I wrote a whole book. Yes. And I think it was then that I was like, wow, I can really take this writing other places. So that's how I got into more like long form writing in English class. They had a segment on poetry. I just sort of kept it up with this one. And like, I had to have a poetry journal. And the first entry is the poem that she gave us on this worksheet that was like, I can X, I would like to be X. And like, when you fill in the blanks, it became its own poem. And from there, I just continued to use poetry as a sort of journal. 
And as I got older, it was, okay, well, I will actually, I'm going to say this to you because this is how I'm feeling. And yes. so in little ways, I had been exercising my voice through writing. And so when I found performance poetry, I was like, oh, writing is already an act of voicing or languaging or expressing. And when I saw that it didn't have to stay on the page, that I wasn't just exercising my voice in a personal gym, if you will, I could just take it out and really be like in communication with people. That's sort of when I was like, my words have force and I can use them. Um, so I, I guess, I guess that's it. I don't know any other or way I also think that I'm just like me, but I think that writing, <laughs> I think that writing and spoken word poetry and just like the fierceness of the way that that spoken word is performed helped me to translate that fierceness even when I wasn't speaking in, in prose and um, spoken word to just continue to articulately advocate for myself and say, what I am saying is this, what I have seen is this. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Can you actually share a poem right now? Sure, I will. I'll, I'll share a poem. So this one is from National Poetry Month. I thought National Poetry Month is in April. Um, and this, well, yeah, no, this, we're in 2021. This <laughs> Poetry Month, there was like a challenge to write a poem a day. And so I decided to do a um a month of odes like so an ode is like praising a certain thing and so I decided to do um a month of them and actually if you'll let me I'll do two that I did like days apart but like they're sort of connected in concept so the first one actually that I'll do Whenever we're together, I always share two poems. I can never choose one. <laughs> yes, you did. You shared two poems. So um, this first one I'll do is to my dissertation, since that's what we were just talking about. An ode to your dissertation. Yes. All right. And NPM, National Poetry Month number one, to my dissertation. Before you get indignant, remember... I didn't always know about you. Was excited with the fervor of the ignorant when I finally heard. Saw freedom, girl, I didn't know better. While you stand there eyeballing, did not come around, did not decide to make you a friend, not some immature high school alliance, did not give you name after loving name, take you further into me with each game of preposition and poetry and carefully placed semicolon, did not. After you get over our breakup last year, friend, I came back. I wanted it to be more of a break, but I couldn't risk the relapse, couldn't risk the tears frying my laptop keys, couldn't risk the panic, couldn't risk 12 hours in bed, half of one on the couch and two more in bed, couldn't risk the hunger pangs, couldn't risk the staying in bed any way. I wanted to love you, but I didn't. I wanted to find my future in you, but it wasn't. I'm not saying screw you and every ivory tower that tried to pry your name out of my fingertips. I'm saying sometimes you got to lose to win, cut your loss to grow your gain. Baby, your labor has been hard. It's a bit easier now, but remember, I didn't always know about you. So I'm trying my best to care for us both. So that's the first one. Um, and that's about like this sort of time after my perspective defense when I switched my dissertation from what it was now, from what it was before um, to what it is now. Yes, I love how you gave it a persona, like you spoke to it <laughs> as if it was a person. I love that. She is. <laughs> <laughs> she is a whole person. <laughs> Personality and all, yes. As man, <laughs> reckless reckless please don't look at me like that girl I put you down I said I was going to come back and I did just mm -hmm. to a different you please um so this second one is npm number 17 to my bed I wrote one of these to sleep 
you and I know this is not that. We're friends. Like sleep and I ain't been in a while. In a grip, it gripped too tight. You're easy, soft, sometimes too, but always ready, welcoming, allowing me to do things in you that I shouldn't, like lay and do nothing, giving me permission to do things I feel guilt about like lay and do nothing. Sometimes we're codependent and we know that, but ain't nobody patient with me like my Lord in my bed. And sometimes you just need that. So I won't critique, won't aspire. I'll just give this ode and gratitude, lay it peacefully as a blanket, cool and ready to cover all faults, block all evil. This poem holds all such things, thankfully, as you hold me. Brie, you are a beautiful writer. I love that. <laughs> that one felt spicy. It felt, it felt like, it reminded me of like, what did you say, Miss Sticky Cookie? It felt like that, like it had that kind of vibe to it. But what's that called? Um, What's it called? It felt, okay, it felt sensual in a way. There was, was a moment intended? where you didn't know what I was going to say. Mm -mm. Was that intentional? A little bit. Okay, I like it, girl. I love it. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Thank you. You're welcome. So can we transition to what you currently study, Black women's legacy in science fiction and fantasy, and what inspired mm -hmm. you to pursue that topic? So my... Oh, wait, can we still back? Can you just, yeah. can you break down what it is? Again, for me, for myself, can you just break down <laughs> what it is and then what inspired you to pursue it? So it's really just looking at science, um, at science fiction and fantasy, mostly fantasy. I'm not, I don't have a lot of science fiction in my dissertation. It's really fantasy, but the genre is SFF, like that's how it's grouped. Mm -hmm. And so um, I... What it, what it is is looking at fantasy novels and seeing and looking at and asking the question of, okay, why in these novels that are contemporarily set, that are set in the present moment, is there a persistent theme of the protagonist having to encounter a slave past? Like I'm talking about New York Times bestsellers of 2021, the character has to go back and meet an ancestor who was enslaved. And I'm like, why? Like this is a teen book, like why? Whether it's whether it's young adult, whether it's adult, like that was just a theme. And so I really was just like, what's up with that? And I wanted to sort of trace it through um, Kendra by Octavia Butler and looking at how, well, that's where we get the start of neo-slave narratives that have fantastic tilts, right? Because that came out in 1979. Octavia Butler is considered the mother of, of um, Afrofuturism. Um, and so that's a different conversation. Um, consider the mother of like Afrofuturism or black sci-fi. And so I was looking at, okay, in, in a wider general African-American literary history, African-American literary history starts with the slave narrative. That's our earliest literature. And so looking at the neo-slave narrative, I was like, what happens if I consider this as a sort of secondary genesis of fantastic narrativization of African-American life? And so that's sort of how I start looking at, well, is that why it seems so such a persistent theme that these characters, no matter the setting, have to encounter a slave past and deal with the legacy of slavery, which is already happening, right? Whenever you see a Black person moving, they're... We are just we are just living in the afterlife of slavery. It's just true. Even if you bring in the way that class allows certain black people to right be to be immune, seemingly immune yeah. to some yeah. of those factors, the afterlife of slavery is what binds this yeah. country because racial capitalism yeah. built this country. So just looking at how that how that's functioning in this fantastic genre. All right. I guess okay. I, I hear what you're saying. Make sense? It makes sense, but I guess what I'm getting stuck is like I cannot tell if you disagree with these people having to encounter their slave past, or I don't disagree. I'm just I'm like why, I'm just looking at the phenomenon and the and the pattern. So I I don't I don't disagree. I'm just look at just and looking at 
the pattern and okay, so they are doing that. Why? Why is that something that is, is necessary? Because in literary discourse, there is this debate about, is it necessary to continue to encounter the slave past? Or does that continue to sort of catastrophize um, the Black experience in America? Should we just let it go? Or do we need to continue to, to right, go back and get it, Sankofa? Do we need to continue to bring that forward in order to move forward with a full identity? And so looking at that debate sort of through these as well. So mm -hmm. where do you think slave legacy lies in science fiction and fantasy? Like, like if you had to take a stance on like whether, no, you don't have to encounter like your slave history in all these novels and stories, or mm -hmm. like, do you think it's important to keep it alive? That's not even my question. Like my question isn't even do, do we need to do it? It's the way, it's the way and the goal. So how are you having them re-encounter their slave legacy? Are you having them actually go back and live in that space like Dana does in Kindred? Or are you having an ancestor, a ghost come forward mm -hmm. um, like in Legend Born by Tracy Dillon, which came out in 2020, right? So like, how are you having us encounter the slave past and to what end is it? for repair, right? Is it so that we can be okay with our slave past or is it um, just for the purposes of like identity? Like, do I just need to know that that is an irreparable trauma, but I need to be aware of it in my day to day? Like I'm looking at what the, what the author's goals seem to be. Are you trying to repair or are you, not, are you saying it's irreparable, but it's something that we have to continue to confront? Um, and I don't have a stance on it, really. I think, I do think that it's, I don't want to be problematic. I do not agree with the thought of Ada Levy Huston calls it redemptive suffering, that you just have to go back and, and witness the trauma of slavery and, and witnessing it and then and in whatever way that we can participating in it, we will be healed if we just let go through that fire. And I'm like, that's not a thing. Going like we can we can re-encounter the trauma of slavery in as many visceral and explicit instances in the archive as we want to. And that's not going to make us feel better about the fact that it happened. It's not going to undo what did happen and what continues to happen. So I don't agree with that, but none of the authors that I am reading have come to that stance anyway. So we're all good on that. But in your writing, in your own personal writing, like the projects that you are working on, does- Oh, these yes, encounters... let's get into it. <laughs> all right, does, does these encounters happen or are you writing from a, like a different stance mm -hmm. where you just kind of omit the slave legacy? Yeah, so there isn't, let me think. So I am working on an adult speculative fiction where there is sort of implicit not to slave legacy because it, de it deals with um, the pandemic of missing black women. And, and it's like, and it's speculative. So in it, there is this sort of like tween place um, of, black, of missing black women and the sort of mythology of the place is that it was born after the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade stopped. So in that way, it engages a history of devaluing and stealing um, black women, but that's sort of, no, yeah. It, so yes, I do. I do in some of my works, but in like in the, in the adult work I do, and I will continue to as the series goes on. In my young adult work that I'm working on, there isn't, yeah, no, there's not. There isn't, there are no encounters with like a slave. Slave legacy. Slave, 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 slave. Okay, nope. and why is that? This is the book that I started writing when I was 16. So yeah, we're a decade in the same. Um, so it, it just wasn't and was never there. And I think that there is something 
potentially, not always, but potentially equally powerful as not requiring your characters to go through trauma in order for it to be a Black story. And so I'm thinking about um, this, this book called Beast of Prey by Ayana Gray. It's a Pan-Africanist fantasy. It came out uh, actually a couple of months ago. And every person in that story is Black. And it does talk about, like, there are nods to it. Like, there's a nod to Marcus Garvey. There's a nod to Patrice Lumumba. Um, there's a nod to convict leasing, right, which, which we know came right after slavery as a way to reintroduce um, coerced labor. So, like, there are historical nods um, to paint, like, to Black people globally. Um, but she does not require her her protagonist to go back through a slave trauma. And that is a point of pride for her. Um, and, so, and, and so I think that there are ways in which we can talk about the Black experience and the difficulty and the resilience of our people without going all the way back to slavery, which is not to act like it doesn't exist, but that's not where every conversation has to start, even if we acknowledge that there is an origin point that goes farther back. So, I, for, so for me, I don't think every story needs to go all the way back to slavery to talk about the Black experience. And it doesn't always have to be traumatic, right? We can have Black girl magic stories that do not require the Black girl to go screaming through some incredible pain that she can bear because that's Black girl magic bearing up under extreme trauma. Yeah, I liked it. Um, I liked it. Thank you for sharing that. So you're talking about your research. We know that you are at Brown University right now in the African Mm -hmm. Studies program. And comparative to your experience at Rhodes, how has the transition been? What it, has your experience been like so far at Brown? Uh, I mean, because it's still a PWI, you know, like I'm you're here. right. I'm not, I'm not gonna insert my experience because it has been in a lot of ways just horrendous, but in a lot uh-huh. of ways, um I have learned a lot of life lessons, and they were some that I wouldn't have gotten if I continued to um acquire knowledge at predominantly black institutions and the real world is not predominantly black right so, moving forward <laughs> what and, and i think the african studies program and i think it's something we talked about but the african studies program is very different from biomedical sciences yeah so, yeah um but here's the thing, and I'm not going to say too much because I still go here. Exactly. Um, Africana studies programs, and this is just like in the academy, are still in the academy. And so even though we talk about radical politics and even though we talk about unsettling things and even though we talk about all these different like revolutionary acts, we study revolutions, we talk about all these things. Black studies departments are departments in the academy. And so there are ways in which the compromises have to be made or without even talking about the necessity of them, compromises get made because we're a department in the, in the university. And so there are ways in which things that happen in the greater academy happen in black studies departments, either in the same way or in different ways that have the same results. You might still have some discomfort because, oh, this politic that I would have expected to come from a black professor, that black professor is being paid by the university. Mm-hmm. And so I have learned that I came here because I wanted to like get to the black stuff, but it's like, are you at the black stuff? Yeah, yeah. Did I get to it the way I thought I was going to get to it? No. Were there times when I was still like, this is not what I need? Absolutely. And so it, it just, it's still, you are still dealing with an appendage of the university. And there's always going to be friction and tension and negotiation that goes into that and, and learning how to negotiate and how to protect myself to negotiate. There has been pain. There has been 
struggles with mental health or I've been learning how to even acknowledge mental health, how to behold myself as someone who has a psyche, right? Like there, there's been all of these things and having to run up against, oh, this is how the exam has to go. Is that not ableist? Oh, this is how you need me to engage this work. Does that not completely separate it from like a tradition of the black creative who was also a black intellectual, right? Like we're not creating that separation, right? So there, there have still been things where I had to realize that it's not what I expected it to be. And so how am I, as someone who identifies as a black creative, even more than as a black theorist, gonna move through this space when this is the syllabus that I'm being given and I'm just like, I don't care about that argument. I don't care about that discourse. Like I know that they're black and that's great, but that's not what is of consequence to me, right? And so just learning how to go, how to meet the standards of the academy and learn, which was a really big thing for me. I had to learn that the standards of the academy are not mine. So even though I have to find a way to meet them, when I don't meet them, when I'm late, um, not to like beat myself up, self up when I don't go to conferences as much as my colleagues do. I have yet to be to a, to go to a single conference. I have nothing published and I felt devastated I was like oh my gosh I suck at this grad school thing I my mental health is a mess for no reason and then I had to realize the reason that I am not performing according to the metrics of my colleagues who are killing it and who always kill it is because I don't have the same goals as them I'm not here for the same thing I want to be a, a published writer who also teaches in the academy that is not the same thing as wanting to be a professor wanting to be a museum curator. Those things are freaking bomb. That's good, but but having that as an aspiration is gonna require you to go through different, um, different protocols than someone who wants to do what I do. It's just different. It's not more rigorous or more valid. It's just different. And I had to learn that it's not more rigorous what they're doing because I have stayed up plenty of nights working on my dissertation, working on my YA fantasy, working on my adult speculative fiction. And the work is intense because you still have to do research for these novels. Looking at the statistics of black women going missing, that that could be a dissertation. And then to take that and make it into a fantastic or a speculative world, like I am still doing all these things, it requires the same level of networking, it requires the same level of preparation, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. And so, and being in the academy as someone who wants to be an educator and also an artist, I had to learn how to hold myself in a way where no part of me got cut off at the door. Um, and that took years, that took like two and a half years of me just figuring out how, why I felt the way I felt and then what I could do and how I could spend my time in ways that made me feel like I was gonna be prepared to do what I wanted to do when I graduate, not prepare me to go into a job that didn't care anything about me when I graduate. Um, I'm glad you figured out that your journey is your own and your destination is not the same as everyone else. It's just as beautiful as they think their destination is but yes you no know, it's just a different journey to get there so it is glad for that but while you were speaking I heard you say you had to learn to protect yourself while navigating this space like this mm -hmm. space to get to where you understood like my journey is my own and during that time your mental health may have struggled a little bit and I, I think that's true for so many people a lot of people yeah. never their mental health until it's like too late and you're just like I need a therapist I can't move now you're in crisis yeah I can't move I can't get out of the bed or whatever so right but but it's prompting me to think about self-care and I mm -hmm. would just like to know what does self-care look like for you I think I have an idea a little bit what some of your self-care looks like but what does self-care look like for you and when did your journey start uh, too late. It started too late. It should have been an ongoing practice, but that just wasn't the reality. Um, it started a little bit before, it was technically still my second year, but it was kind of the end of my second year. It's, it started um, like the semester before I started my third year exams. 
And that's when I, and that was before I had like a major depressive episode. And so just because you're starting your mental health journey does not mean that you're not going to have any more crisis. You still will. Oh, absolutely. I think <laughs> just, you know, girl, I don't have to bring mine up, but yes, all right. just for anyone watching, <laughs> as you start taking care of yourself does not mean you will have no more crisis. That's not how it works. Yeah. And it is a journey. It is definitely a journey because, you know, as life changes, the, the spaces that exactly. you change and what your mental health and your physical health need will change as well. Change, exactly, exactly. So it started then and it has changed. When I first started, um, and this is, it started when I sort of had that aha of like, it's okay that you're not going to conferences and publishing and familiar with all the theorists that your colleagues are because that's not what you want. And then I was like, what do I want? And I realized that I had forgotten. I felt like a failure because I was preparing myself to, you know, be a full professor at some institution and do that until I die. But the reality is the that's a devastating aspiration, whether I wanted it for myself or not, like it still is pretty devastating because this, I read this um, essay and it's called Salvation is the Issue by, Ma- by Maisha Priest. And she says, and I'm paraphrasing, she says like the, the, the life expectancy for the average black woman in America is something like 73, 75, something like that. The life expectancy for someone, for a black woman in the academy is like 54. And I was like, did I read that correctly? Like that is a staggering difference. And that's, I don't want that for myself. So that's why I said, even if I had wanted to be a full professor, that's all I wanted to be. It, 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 it has to be the stress. It, it, wow. It seemed like yeah. people would be telling you as a black woman, I do not recommend that you go into the academy. Because Doctors don't tell us a lot of stuff that they should be telling us. Oof. Okay. Yes. That's its own be. situation, but we know that historically doctors don't tell us what they should tell us. They don't even believe when we tell us things about ourselves. Yes. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's its own thing. But when I read that, I was heartbroken um, because, you know, you want to be in this space and you want to belong here, but it's clear that the academy, the relationship between the academy and the Black woman is, is somewhat carnivorous. Like, you want me to work here. And some people do refer to it as as an intellectual plantation. You want me to work here, you want me to grind it out. But the minute I expire early because of the stress of doing this work and these conditions, you will just replace me with another black woman or with a white man, with with whoever, right? Like you, you replace me. And so, that that's just like some of the things that I was beginning to think about when I start thinking about mental health, I was thinking about it from a research perspective. How are other black women dealing with this? And what I found was there's a long history of us just dying. Like even back to like um, Marcus Garvey's wife, like her body and the stress it went under from working long hours and a sexist, like it's just ridiculous. Seeing Audrey Lord, June Jordan, so many, Barbara um, Smith, so many. And that's like spans generations of, of black intellectuals that we have all this respect for died from their body failing. Yeah. Right. From yeah. cardiac events, from aggressive cancers, all like looking at all these different things. That's what my research used to do. And I could not do it anymore because I was like, this is breaking me down. I, mm-hmm. I cannot look at centuries of black women's bodies failing from doing this work in these conditions and us upholding their work and not acknowledging how their lives were extinguished yeah. right even if it's not the sort of violence that we know how to track yet even if it's open a cardiac event but why what was the stress on the heart such that it gave up and yeah. so yeah. I was looking at those things I was thinking about myself I was seeing a very dis- disconcerting um, like connection with them of the work that I was trying to ask myself to do and the way that I was feeling doing it. I was like, we got to interrupt this. And so that's when I sort of realized 
I did, I've always wanted to be a teacher, but, but, but I wanted to be when I was a kid, literally a teacher, a writer, and an actor. I wanted all those things yeah. at the same time. And I was like, when did I allow the teaching to take on, to, to step to the front? Like, when did I allow that? And to step to the front in this way. And I realized that I had come in trusting Brown so much. Don't be only trusting these institutions. They don't care about you. But I came in trusting this institution so much that I took their word for what it was to be an educator. And that warped my original desire. And so when I had to sort of um, go back and retrieve that, and then I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I just sat and I just, I allowed myself to dream about all the different things that could happen. I allowed myself to dream of what would happen if I um, just went and became an actress, just thugged it out, like went back, lived with my parents, did some small acting roles into like, what would happen, right, if I did that? Or even found a way to just link up with the Brown MFA program. What would happen if I did that? What would happen if I just took my master's, which I already had, my master's in Africana, and go teach at a charter school? What would happen if I did that? What would happen if I went and taught K-12, right? Things that I was already qualified to do or willing to do the work to do. And what I found was that I was happy with those things. It, it didn't feel like a failure. It, it felt like a resurrection of dead dreams and I was okay with doing the work to bring them back. And so when I realized that I did not have to complete this goal for the sake of completing this goal to be happy, I became relieved and it gave me new energy because I can stop whenever I want to. Mm -hmm. If ever this does not serve me, if ever the cost is too high, I have other dreams that I could chase that would make me just as con more content, right? And so when I, and being a writer, right? And I was like, oh, okay. I could do those things happily in conjunction with teaching um, higher education or completely divorced from it. And I, I felt new energy at that. And so to answer your question, of uh, your original question for this section of like, what it, what it mental, what it healthcare look like for me. Um, healthcare, yeah. Yes, what it's looking like for me, when I had that multifaceted, right? Because it was research, it was personal, like it was all these things. What I, I had this realization <clears throat> and I was like, okay, well, let's start investing in some of those dreams. Acting is time consuming and it requires a lot of travel that I don't have the money for right now. So let me go back to my dream of being a writer, right? Let's revisit that because I can do that now. And so writing at that point <clears throat> became my self-care. I would, I could sit up until three in the morning writing and just be so happy. Like it was a good kind of exhaustion. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. I have to go to sleep and go to sleep. Just like, huh, right. If you're going to be tired anyway, and if you're in grad school, you are, if you're going to be tired anyway, you might as well choose your, choose your exhaustion, right? Yeah, choose wait, what you're going to what were you writing about? Was it like journaling or writing towards your novel? Yeah, or? I just, I pulled out that novel that I had not looked at for a couple, for like three years and was like, well, let's just start reading this and revising it. And joy, really happy. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started reading again also. I had not read a novel in years, mm -hmm. right? A novel that was not for a class. I started reading YA fantasy again. And I was just so happy to disappear into those worlds. Audiobooks are amazing. I was just getting my life. Mm -hmm. And so reading and writing became like the first iteration of that. And then when, when I started my booktube channel to find more community with other readers and writers, found my critique partner there, people who were also taking their writing journey seriously, it became more of like less of a hobby and stress relief and more of like, you're taking this seriously as a career path now. And so it didn't immediately become like stressful. Um, and I wouldn't consider writing stressful now. It's more of the, like the production of writing that is stressful and emotional and whatever. Um, but at first it was, it was writing um, and reading. Um, and now that I am doing those things um, more seriously and with more intention towards, you know, making it a career, I have a timeline that I want. Okay, I need to find a literary agent. Okay.
email, drafts, all these things, query letters, synopsis, all these different things that are like, okay, that's professional. It's not as much fun, but I, this is the work that I've chosen for myself. And I chose to be in grad school, but my eyes were not wide open to what grad school was. Um, and I chose this in a diff with a different level of understanding of what that would mean. Um, and so I'm still happy with it. And so now self-care is not necessarily writing, although I do believe that if I stopped doing it, my mental health would decline again. And so it's work that matters to me that keeps me right balanced because I work on my dissertation and I feel a certain exhaustion and I work on my novel and I feel escape and exhaustion, but I need both of those things together. Um, and so I, I do that. And I also just became really involved in my church community. I teach, but Aurora knows, like we, <laughs> okay, okay. Because when I said, I think I know what your mental health looks like or, or your self-care looks like, I knew it was church because every weekend we cannot pin you down because I have a church activity. And like I always say, I'm not hating girl. I love that for you, but like, can we get some Brit time? <laughs> so go ahead. Yeah, I, because God has shown up for me Amen. in such amazing ways. I, you, you have to, like, I, I think I had gotten to a point where I was treating God like Santa Claus. And I come to him when I want something mm -hmm. and dear Lord, please give me X, 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 and X. Mm -hmm. um, but I, there are some valleys that it is harder to get through if you have to call God to you as opposed to him already being with you when you enter it, right? So for me, I, I was, I was, I've gone to church every Sunday, most of my life. Like, that's not a thing. I was like going to church, but going to church and having a relationship with God are not the same thing. He does command us to not forsake the assembly, right? To be there to worship him in the corporate worship on Sunday. But our life should already be a worship. Like we should be in his word and thanking him and in conflict well, all the time. Mm -hmm. And my, my communion with him was not there. And so when I was in this valley of my perspectives defense and was just like, I think I'm gonna have to drop out. Like, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this. My, I was talking to my dad and I was telling him, I have not had suicidal ideations prior to this point and I'm playing with ideas that I don't like. And I don't wanna be here. I don't wanna be here. I don't feel like my committee is listening to me when I tell them that I'm not okay. They continue to press me. I'm writing this 25 page prospectus um, I, I rewrote that thing five times in a month. I was like, I can't, yeah. I, I can't do this. Um, and my dad is a preacher and an English teacher and a basketball coach. So essentially he is the trifecta of life metaphors is what I'm saying to you. <laughs> and he was like, okay, now that you know that they don't care about you the way you thought they did, deal with them according to knowledge. Right, you don't have to make yourself vulnerable to them in those ways where you say, I need X, X, and X, my mental health, whatever, whatever. Like, don't give them that kind of access to you, and but don't let them be a mountain that cannot be moved. And he would, he was, it was a Saturday, and he was like, Wow, I'm preaching this sermon tomorrow, and I didn't know I was gonna teach, I'm gonna be preaching it to my baby. And he was saying, like, um, the sermon that he was talking about was, Lord, give me this mountain. And he was essentially saying like, we have inherited blessings that we want, that we don't know how to claim because we have not studied the conditions for claiming them. Um, and one of the things that he talked about was like, have, yeah, this was when like, it was right when COVID was starting. And so one thing that he said was, how many of you are praying not for like your safety, in this pandemic, but forgot to end the pandemic. How many of you praying, how many of you are praying for him to awaken the minds of these medical professionals to a cure, to, to a whatever? Like, what are you praying for? Is your prayer one of like little faith? Oh, just can you just do this? 
well, why are you asking the one who made everything to just do this instead of saying, can you do what I know you can, yeah. right? And yeah. so when he said that, I was like, I have not prayed for God to deliver me through this prospectus defense. And when I did that night, I had this like eureka moment about reframing it. And that was the first bit of excitement and hope I had felt for weeks. And so it was then that I was like, you know, my relationship with God has to be different. Like it just has to be. He has power over my imagination. He has power over my finances. And if I'm going to say he has power over those things, then I have to submit those things to him. I have to submit my body to him. I have to submit my imagination to him, my time, my finances. And so like, I got to be around his people doing that work, like ministry activities, ministry meetings, ministry work, those things. Um, being around people who are also just trying to run after God and get the strength that they need to do his work, even though there may be around people five, six days a week who don't share their convictions, who don't care anything about their God, who are, who are trying to relabel things out of God's own vocabulary, right? So that's why I'm just like, I gotta be right up on, I gotta be right up on my, my church family because they give me strength and courage mm -hmm to speak for God in a world that is really disrespectful to him, yeah, right? Yeah. And so that that just became a place of just safety and retreat. It's my church is an hour away. And sometimes it is, it's really like frazzling to have to drive that long. And then sometimes I get supreme joy out of driving away from this city and just being completely somewhere else. Yeah, um, yeah. And so that's been, that's where I am now with my mental health. Like my biggest stalwart pillar of it is just investing in my relationship with God and in his work, right? Just availing myself to what is it that you want me to do planted where you have me? Yes, amen. And what about mentors in mentorship? So um, in church, I'm sure you find good mentors in academic settings. How do you, like, what is it when you meet someone, what is it that you look for that tells you like this person will be someone that I would like to keep in contact with, that I would like to have as a mentor? And how have you gone about um, making those kind of connections and establishing those relationships? I look at their work. Do they do work that I would want to do? Um, I look at they how they carry themselves. Is that a way that I want to learn how to act in certain, excuse me, in certain situations? Um, and I look at how they deal with me when I approach them. Do you seem like you want to have a relationship with me beyond this one encounter? Do you seem like interested and in, in caring on a relationship? And so I academically <clears throat> mentors are for a season just like friends are so in academia there are people who I thought would be mentors who seasons have carried them out they have gotten busy they have not actually done the work of mentorship because whatever they're busy and I've had to like learn to read those signs and not take them with bitterness just understanding seasons carry people out of your life personally and professionally and so college professors who I had who were like hit me whatever I'm and then I hit them up and there's radio silence and it's like oh you're busy with new students right and you just move on um and so finding mentors here has really been a thing of like like my dad said do with them a friend of knowledge they're not gonna be able to be everything that you want them to be. And you won't be as disappointed if you don't expect that, if you adjust your expectations when that becomes clear to you. So people on my committee who I felt way about for not honoring my admission of like mental fragility the way I wanted them to, my first re my first reaction was like, give my mind with me anymore, whatever, whatever. But we can't do that unless you're gonna leave because yeah. Professionally, those are the people who are going to be writing your letters and who are helping you with your dissertation. But you cannot have a contentious relationship with them and be successful. Um, and so I had to learn, like, 
how do I want to deal with them? What do I want to consider um, our shared responsibility? And that, so that has helped me professionally is just to be willing and able to adjust my expectations of that person. Um, and personally, it has been, what is that person doing? What work do they do? How do they talk to me? As you were speaking, I learned a lot about you. And I think some of the things that you said that really inspired me was when you were talking about how you found your voice. You mentioned that your father was a pastor and a basketball coach and an English teacher. These things I did not know. And also that most of your family is from Georgia and Arkansas. And mm-hmm. so I just really want to know how did your home community influence like all the things that you are today and strive to do? I think I will be finding out the answer to that question for the rest of my life. Because if you'd asked me this when I was in college, I would have been like, it didn't. <laughs> like, because I was a, I was and am, um, believe it or not, an introvert. Like, I can go to public events. That doesn't mean that I'm going to, like, participate when I'm there. That I make feel like people watching unless I know people, know people who are there. And so a lot of the stuff, like, I was writing. I was reading. I was watching anime. These are solitary activities. And so I, it's not like Arkansas does nothing for me. It's just that I was not out and in my community and just like really seeing stuff. And so I went to college when I was um, 17 for two weeks, but I did not really become aware of like the community around me until I was in college because I was out and about in Memphis. Um, And so, but I, I would have said it didn't, but now, excuse me, when I came up to um, New England and people would be surprised at the, at my candor, I did not think that it was candor. Like, I mean, I knew it was candor, but I, I mean, they were acting like candor was like a commodity up here. And I was like, y'all tell the truth. And so I think But Brie, you tell the truth. We just had this discussion when you were you and um what's her face? Alera, Alera. down my throat a couple of weeks ago. So I mean, but Alera's not from Arkansas and she still did that. So I feel like at some point No, a- but you were the ringleader. So I- you were I leading. Lion on you the were leading, and she was just following your cue. I was completely silent for spectrum of that conversation. Just watching. Yeah, the- after you t- put the agenda out, and she was like, "Okay, well, I'm gonna go back and touch these points." But anyway, <laughs> anyway, anyway, I'm not over it. I'm not over it. It's clear. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, though. <laughs> I. I'm a candid and direct person. And I I think I got that from Arkansas. Like, what is it? And then that's it. Like, we're having this conversation about what? Like, let's just get into it. What are you trying to say? And so I think in some ways that as well contributed to me being able to be more direct. Even when I got two hours away in Memphis to be like, I'm. Sorry, are we pretending like I didn't send you an email saying this. We're pretending like you don't just let your students run off at the mouth until I corral them as another student. Like, I think that I think that just contributed to me not call out cultures. I don't like call out culture, um, but just saying in a honest conversation, can we just deal with the fact so that we can not have to have this meeting three times more before we get to some real talk about what you are and are not going to do. So okay. I think my voice. Don't be salty. I love you. <laughs> if I didn't love you, I would have been like, okay, great. And ate my food and moved on. Like, no, thank you. Thank you for the answer, Brit. Um, and I'm not salty. I I there's nothing to forgive. I appreciate your honesty. I've grown to um <laughs> admire that about you. <laughs> <laughs> it no, is a cross I have to